Welcome back to Simply Shemaine. I'm so glad you're here. My goal is to cover a little bit of current events, some healthy living tips, and talk about family and faith and just a wide variety of topics. On today's show, we have Roger Stone, who almost went to prison. We have Rachel Duffy, who is going to talk about her new show on Fox Nation called Moms. And you know her and love her. Alex Clark is going to be here and talk about pop, pop culture without the leftist propaganda. And of course, as always, we'll end with something to make you smile. So let's get right to it. In the pre-dawn hours of January 25th, more than a dozen FBI agents raided Roger Stone's home in Florida and took him into custody. Recently, President Trump commuted his prison sentence and Roger is with us. Roger, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Roger, take us back to those uh, pre-dawn hours in that raid, if you would. What happened and what was going through your mind? Well, uh, for two years, the mainstream media, because of my 40-year relationship with candidate Donald Trump, predicted that I would be charged in the Mueller investigation with treason, espionage, uh, money laundering, millions of rubles into uh, American illegal campaign contributions, conspiracy against the United States, uh, cyber crimes, including the receipt and dissemination of uh, stolen material. Uh, the, uh, no, that way, please. Uh, I'm sorry, we had a little camera issue. No there. worries. Uh, the uh, the uh, cyber crimes, including the receipt and dissemination of stolen data, uh, cyber crimes, including um, uh, unauthorized access to a computer, uh, mail fraud, wire fraud, aiding and abetting a conspiracy. And oh. CNN and MSNBC were repeat were reporting this constantly for almost two years. We knew that we were under investigation because although we were not contacted by the special counsel, 19 of my current or former associates were dragged in front of the grand jury, threatened, badgered. None of them had any evidence, of course, of any of those no, no. crimes. Uh, and um, this kind of reached a crescendo at the end of 2018. Uh, when multiple media outlets were reporting, Roger Stone is next. Roger Stone is in Mueller's crosshairs. Mueller's, Roger Stone is, is, is zeroing in on, uh, Robert Mueller is zeroing in on Roger Stone and so on. And of course, this was kind of vexing because I knew that there was no Russian collusion, that there was no collaboration by, with WikiLeaks, uh, that I had done nothing whatsoever that was illegal in my independent and private efforts to help Donald Trump, my friend of 40 years become president. I had resigned from his campaign a year before to publish my book, The Clinton's War on Women, which remains the definitive opposition research dump on the epic corruption of Bill and Hillary Clinton. Uh, and then on the morning of January 25th, 2019, uh, 29 FBI agents arrived in 17 armored vehicles there was a government helicopter up overhead. Uh, two amphibious units pulled up to the uh, the canal behind my house, uh, and uh, they surrounded my home. And I was arrested for the first time white collar nonviolent crime uh, of uh, process crimes of lying to Congress. To say that this was a, a, a Gestapo style raid. Uh, designed for television would not be an understatement because amazingly, just 14 minutes before the FBI arrived, a CNN camera truck arrived and set up a tripod 25 feet from my front door. That is amazing. Um, how coincidental, how yes. amazingly coincidental. Uh, so I, they pounded on the door. They brought this giant battering ram up to the door as if they were going to have to break it in. They had these vicious dogs on, uh, on leashes Every one of the FBI agents was fully outfitted in SWAT gear. They had their night goggles on. They were all carrying assault weapons. Uh, it was a very scary experience, uh, except for I was expecting them. I had gotten up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd received a tip from uh, somebody at CNN, inadvertently, I might add, that they were coming. Uh, I put on my Roger Stone did nothing wrong T-shirt, uh, and I sat in upstairs bathroom window waiting for them. And... Um, it was, uh, you know, I opened the door. They said, are you Roger Stone? I am. I said, I am. They said, step outside. We have a warrant for your arrest. 
put your hands behind your back. They handcuffed me, dragged me out in the street. Then they went up to the second story bedroom. They woke my wife up, who is deaf. She woke up looking down the barrel of two guns. She didn't know if it was a home invasion. She had no idea what was happening. They dragged her out in the street barefoot in her night clothing. She's not accused of any crime. Uh, but they wanted to make sure CNN got good footage mm. of her to humiliate us. Uh, and all of this was done uh, by the FBI. And we still don't have an answer as to who in Donald Trump's FBI approved this raid. Because just the day before, Shemaine, they were talking to my lawyer on the phone. The special counsel's office had received from us 30 pages of text messages that proved that my source regarding the very vague understanding I had of the WikiLeaks disclosures that was to come came from exactly who I told the House Intelligence Committee it did come from, Randy Credico. Mm. They ignored that exculpatory evidence, and instead they arrested me the next day. That has begun a two-year odyssey of fighting for my freedom. I was taken to a trial in the District of Columbia that was more like a Soviet-style show trial than what you would expect in the United States. The judge uh, basically prohibited any powerful line of defense. The jury was thoroughly stacked with Trump haters. There was not a single Republican, not a single military veteran, not a single libertarian, not a single free thinker. Uh, it, it was uh, completely stacked with rabid partisans who were either alumni of the Bush or Clinton administration. These were political appointees, not civil servants, people who worked in left wing think tanks, People work for liberal democratic political action committees, democratic activists, uh, people with direct connections to the prosecutors, people with direct connections to the FBI or the DOJ. Uh, judge Jackson, the judge in my case, held that hatred for Donald Trump or uh, activism in the Democratic Party would not be grounds for, re for uh, releasing a juror from the jury pool. Uh, the whole thing was a railroad. It uh, really, it, was, it, it really sounds Biden like it. It really sounds well, like it, it. It sounded more like some you'd see in Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia than the United States. Uh, Roger, and then, how, how, let me ask you, how are you doing, you and your wife, how are you doing now? All of that being said, everything that you've been through in the past two years, how are you doing? Well, we're doing well, and I'll tell you why. Back in January, uh, I had occasion to meet Reverend Franklin Graham. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I continue, I had seen Billy Graham preach as a young man when I was 12 years old at a tent revival in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And um, it's still one of the most memorable events of my early life. Uh, but I met with Reverend Graham because I knew he was a close friend of the president. I had been prohibited from speaking to my friend, the president, for two years by my lawyers and his lawyers, probably wise. Uh, and uh, I asked for his help. I asked him to put in a good word with the president for me, and he said he would see what he could do. But more importantly, he gave me a much broader solution to my issues. Mm. He asked me about my, my faith, and I told him that I had born, been born and received all my sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church, that I believed in Jesus Christ, I believed in the resurrection, I believed in God, but that I had fallen away. Mm. Uh, and he gave me the best piece of advice I've ever had, other than perhaps when one of my sisters told me to marry my terrific wife, that would be up there with that. He told me to be reborn, to reaffirm my faith in Christ, to confess my sins, uh, to get right with God, to pledge to sin no more. And he assured me that if I did these things, that God would protect me, that God would defend me, that God would never abandon me, and God would see me through this crisis. And Shemaine, that's exactly what happened. I stood up with five under, other Christians in a field in Boca Raton. I confessed my sins. I got right with Jesus Christ. I reaffirmed my faith. That was on a Saturday. Monday morning, the story about the epic corruption of the jury forewoman, which I knew nothing whatsoever about because she had kept her attacks on me on social media on a private setting during jury selection and during my trial, bust wide open in the American press. And that was the beginning uh, of the president's uh, uh, understanding of the epic corruption of my trial. And it was the one of the two bases on which he saved me from dying mm -hmm. in a COVID-19 infested prison in Georgia. Only a week ago, the DC uh, judge, Amy Berman Jackson ruled, contrary to all legal precedent in every circuit in the United States, including DC, in which people in my circumstance 
appeal for compassionate release or compassionate transfer to be protected from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Contrary to the current policies of the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Contrary to my health and my age, I'm 67. I know I look much younger. You do. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I'm in, uh, and, I, and I've had asthma my whole life. Mm. Uh, and contrary to the claims of the judge that there was no danger from COVID-19 uh, COVID in the prison they want to send me to, there are now 113 active cases and 83 pending test results. The judge ordered me to prison next Tuesday. And her reasoning is very clear. They don't want my appeal to ever be heard. Right. If I die, my appeal dies with me, and my appeal will expose the epic corruption of the judge, the jury, and the prosecutors in my case. That they cannot afford. So the president didn't just act politically, he actually saved my life. Yeah. Uh, and I give thanks to God Almighty to give him the spiritual guidance that I believe he gives the president every single day, because yeah. that's the toughest job in the world. That's why I'm happy to be here to tell my story. I know there are certain people out there, certain elites who will scoff and who will say, oh, that's stone acting, that's stone pandering, that's stone, uh, you know, in some kind of ploy or some kind of head fake for, for uh, you know, public sympathy. I don't really care what they say, Shemaine, because he, he that's knows right. what's in my heart. That's, that's right. That's all that matters. And you know what, Roger? I love that. I saw a video of you saying, I'm good because God's got my back. So, Roger, thank you so much for being here. God bless you and your wife. Stay healthy. Stay strong. Keep praying. I'm going to be praying for you, too. Uh, I thank you so much for inviting me. I know we've tried to connect on the phone several times, yeah. but my life is uh, still chaotic. I get it. Because the deep state criminals, they never stop. Yep. The morning after I was commuted, they were right back out there the next day trying to recycle the same nonsense. Stone is a Russian spy. Stone is a traitor. No, I'm not. My, my uh, family members were mowed down by Russian tanks in Budapest in 1956. Mm. So to accuse me of being partial to the Russians is total nonsense. Uh, I admire so much what you and your husband do. God bless you and thank you so much for having me. And again, I apologize for our technical limitations. No worries. But I'm glad we were able to get together. I am too. Thank you so much, Roger. Have a great day. Make it a great day. Do something healthy and happy for you and your wife today. Thank you again. Thank you. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Patriot Mobile was built on the values of Americans. We are humbled, recently achieving the highest customer satisfaction among all wireless providers. As America's only Christian conservative wireless service provider, you'll receive great performance and we'll donate a portion of every dollar earned to support your values. Try a wireless company that really cares about you and your values. Call us today, mention Shemaine, and get our best promotion. Rachel Campos Duffy is the host of a new show on Fox Nation called Moms. She's an author, a mother of eight, and her happy demeanor always makes me smile. Rachel, Rachel thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Shemaine. I'm going to correct you for one second. I have nine kids now. <gasps> I have a little late month old. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Well, no, thank you. Okay. If you have me back, it's on your. Show, by the way, have another, so. <laughs> it's on your website, so you might need to change. <laughs> I do. I need to switch that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I, how do you do it, Rachel? You, we were just talking about you flying back and forth to New York. You're on Outnumbered. You have a new show called Moms. What is your secret? How do you juggle a career and nine kids? So the number one thing is have a great husband who helps you out. So while I was at Outnumbered, he was getting this YouTube thing set for me and we prepped for my show together. And he's just such a great partner um, for me and everything that I do. And, and, and I am for him too. Um, and the second thing is you have to be a really great delegator. So mm -hmm. if you think you can do it all and be super mom, um, it just doesn't work. So I'm, I'm not afraid to tell my kids to unload the dishwasher or, you know, find their little sister shoe or whatever um, I have to do that because I'm only human <laughs> yeah I, I can't even imagine juggling so many things how do you stay healthy and energized 
So one of the things that I, I started doing, I, I was one of those people that had a Peloton. Remember when the Peloton ad came out and they said that ad came out about the husband who bought the Peloton for the wife. And then they said that it was really, you know, sexist of him. Well, my husband bought me a Peloton, but I wanted one. And over COVID, I tell you, I'm so glad that I had home equipment because working out does keep me sane. And when I get too busy to work out, um, I definitely sense that anxiety, you know, cause I'm not, releasing it and i think working out really really is important obviously having a prayer life and being god-centered um is clearly the number one thing but I, for me i also need that physical um uh exertion to you know release some of the stress and and, and refocus let's talk about your show moms you talk about prayer and having faith what are some of the topics that you also consider when, when talking about moms do you talk about relationships parenting we talk about all of it, kids, relationships, parenting, what's what's affecting moms right now. Our latest episode is moms who are worried about socialism. I mean, mm. I think COVID has done a lot to, um, the homeschooling part of it has done a lot to wake people up to the indoctrination that was happening. So they were home. I know I was home watching. I always knew my kid's school was kind of liberal, but I saw some of the curriculum. My son actually had communist propaganda videos that he was required to watch for his um, high school senior class and yet there was no counter view there was no discussion and they were promoting um, some of the worst population control forced abortion policies um, in this video and sort of normalizing it and making it look pretty happy and yet um, I, I mean I had no idea that was happening and then I think after that period of homeschooling which was so hard for parents and they were kind of getting alert to this then we saw um, the, the George Floyd um, murder the initial good protests and then BLM and the Marxists sort of taking over it and we saw how easily people were were drawn into so much America hating and and burning statues of of George Washington and undermining our founding. And I think a lot of parents sat back and said, well, we really have ceded too much to the school. The, the teachers' colleges are so liberal. Um, they're, they're, they're bordering on Marxists. And we need to take more control of the curriculum and what our kids are getting. And I think that's what you'll see in this latest episode. Mom's going, oh my goodness, um, we, need, we need to be more involved in our kids' education. What do you say to a parent who's worked so hard enough to earn enough money to send their kids to a great school, a great college, only to find when they come home, they're brainwashed by liberal propaganda. Yeah. What do you say to those moms? You know, I find myself asking the same questions all the time. I have a daughter that attends the University of Chicago, um, which has such a great uh, reputation. And my husband and I will sit up at night sometimes and say, why are we feeding this beast? You know, why are we giving money to these institutions that are really not educating, they're indoctrinating and they have such a bias. I mean, you're looking at 99% of the faculty being, you know, liberal and, you know, five to one percent, you know, percent being um, conservative or, or even neutral. So it is scary. I think what parents need to realize and what we're seeing as um, has helped us as we send kids off to college. So we have one in college, one we're sending off in the fall to the University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin and Madison, is that we have to start early. The earlier you start having conversations with your kids about what makes America great, about our foundation, um, they're trying to sell our kids this idea that somehow America was founded um, on slavery and bondage. That's not true. We did have slavery in our country and it was an evil, but the idea of starting America had did not have to do with slavery. It had to do with liberating ourselves um, and our country um, from the monarchy um, in England. and so. There's a real um, effort to to literally rewrite history to fit this Marxist oppressive um, worldview that has this political objective rather than telling history as it is. And so you have to start early. And the good news for parents is the you are still the most important and influential um, person or voice in your parent in your child's life. So if you're having these conversations about capitalism and socialism um, and and our history and what makes America great, those things are going to take are going to take like little seeds into your child's um, 
mind and heart. And so when these conversations come up in school and they're happening at younger and younger um, grades that you're seeing the indoctrination, they're going to begin to question these things that they're hearing and challenge them. And that's what we want our kids to do. And so start young. Um, if you're not talking to your kids about socialism, somebody else is. Yeah. So if you own a business, um, you know, have your kid, you know, come into work and talk to them about what it takes to run a business and how many people you employ and all the good that you do in your community with the, with the profits that you bring home. Um, you know, because often it's small business owners who are donating all over the place in our in our communities um, to make things better. So you need to have these conversations and you need to not cede um, all of this to um to the schools, which which sadly our teachers colleges have been absolutely taken over by Marxists. What you're saying is for parents to get involved and to parent. Yeah, to parent. And I, but I, but I think that I think you know they they have to do that. But I think it can it comes from the idea. Um, I think a generation or two before when you and I were, you know, in, in, in elementary school, so many elements of the culture sort of supported the values that you and I share and things have changed dramatically. And I think parents maybe weren't aware of just how much. So if you think that sports, Hollywood, you know, big tech, social media, all of these forces um, are now owned by the left. And these are very powerful cultural uh, forces. And conservatives in general have basically focused on economics and tax cuts, and they've let our universities, our schools, um, entertainment and social media and big tech kind of be taken over um, by the other side. And I think it was a big strategic mistake. So we're definitely behind the ball as a conservative traditional movement. Um, but it's not, um, it's the, the battle's not over. We still have to keep fighting. Um, we haven't lost yet. Yes, well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking time out of your amazingly busy schedule. Tell us about your books before we go. Uh, sure. Absolutely. I have a uh, my first children's book came out. It's called Paloma wants to uh, Paloma wants to be Lady Freedom. It's about a little girl. It was, it was sort of based on my daughter's um, own experience of, of seeing our beautiful national capital for the first time. She fell in love with the statue at the top of the dome um, of our of our beautiful, magnificent Capitol building. And so it's a story about a little girl who falls in love with that statue, gets lost inside the Capitol um, and discovers what it means um, to be in America, an American why she loves America, why her dad, who happens to be an immigrant to America, um, decided to make that decision to become a citizen. And that's a really personal story to me, Shmay, because my mom became an American citizen when I was in, around kindergarten, around mm. the age of the little girl in the book. So there's a lot of personal elements to it, but it's a beautiful patriotic book. There aren't enough patriotic children's books out there. So I hope that all your listeners will go onto Amazon or Barnes and Noble or their local bookstores and support authors like me who are trying to um, educate and instill a love for the United States of America and our children, something they're not getting enough of in the culture and in their schools. I absolutely agree. And thank you so much. I will definitely encourage all of the listeners to go out and grab your book right away because we do need more children to learn about the values that we know and love to be true, faith, family, and country. Amen to that, Shmi. Thank all you. All right. Thank you so much for joining me, Rachel. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Stay tuned. We have a lot more coming up. We'll be right back. Patriot Mobile was built on the values of Americans. We are humbled, recently achieving the highest customer satisfaction among all wireless providers. As America's only Christian conservative wireless service provider, you'll receive great performance and we'll donate a portion of every dollar earned to support your values. Try a wireless company that really cares about you and your values. Call us today, mention Shemaine, and get our best promotion. Well, you know her and you love her. It's Alex Clark of Poplitics. Alex, thanks so much for joining me. I'm so excited to be back already. We had so much fun last time. I know, we should do this like often, all the time. So tell me, Alex, what is the latest going on right now in current events and pop culture and conservative 
eras of the, you know, everything that's going on in the world, there's so much and it's so intense. What's, what's the biggest topic right now? Well, this week, Chrissy Teigen deleted 60,000 tweets that she had posted over the last nine, 10 or so years. Kind of um, edgy comments about children. Uh, basically, people are now wondering, is Chrissy Teigen not who we thought she was? Is she in one of these billion dollar elitist pedophile rings? And I know you're like, whoa, but I mean, that's what people are wondering because some of these tweets were just a little weird. Um, off color talking, making jokes about toddlers and tiaras, that show I think it was on TLC, um, talking about like, oh my gosh, uh, like, why are toddlers' tummies so, like, cute and sexy? Yeah, and I saw, I saw one where she wrote that um, half-naked half girls doing the splits, yada, 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 and I thought, hmm, you know, yeah. I might have, maybe I, should, maybe I should call the police on myself or something yes, like that. Yeah. So they were very edgy, and then what people started doing was they started digging up old interviews of her. So she did an interview on the red carpet with her husband, John Legend. They were asked, where's the craziest place that you guys have hooked up? And she said, oh, I don't know. John's going to be happy that I say this, but it was the Obama thing. And then she clarified and said, oh, well, it wasn't um, it wasn't uh, his inauguration. It, it was it was something else. It was before he ran for president. So everybody sharing that video going, well, what does that mean? What Obama thing? And everybody now because John, her husband, got visibly very nervous that she had brought it up on the red carpet. And then there's another video of her on, she did a some TV show or something and she made a joke saying um, that she would be curious to know what human flesh tasted like. Seriously? I yes. did not know. Oh my gosh. So that's not looking too good for Chrissy. Considering everything right now, um, there's talk of this worldwide pedophilia ring and she was on the flight register for going to the Epstein Island. So, yeah, that's not looking too good for her right now. Well, I don't know if she was confirmed on the flight logs. I know that, um, like, Kevin Spacey was, Bill Clinton was for sure confirmed. I think there, she might be rumored, but I don't know if we know for sure yet. We might have to look that up. But I do know that with Chrissy, it's like, okay, the thing about Chrissy Teigen is she is a comedian. She's She always says silly, outlandish stuff. That's why she's famous on social media. I mean, she's a com comedian in the social media sense. She is a model, and that's how she got linked up with John Legend. But she is a very funny person. She posts crazy things. So the question is, okay, like several years ago, the way that we made jokes was just different. People yes. were less sensitive. There was a lot, there's been a lot of people that we've dug up stuff that it's like, Hey, they're making jokes about kids. And you know, is it worth canceling them over? Um, or is it just, okay, we wouldn't joke about that now, but then that was just something that we did. The, the question is, is the stuff she's saying really, you know, did she mean it maliciously? Is there something right. deeper on her? Is she just being an edgy, outlandish comedian. I do believe that we have become too sensitive. I mean, I don't know how comedians are going to, what do you, what do you make jokes about anymore? Everything is taboo. Well, a lot of comedians are saying that they're getting out of it. They're saying, I don't even want to do stand up anymore. It's not worth it because I can't joke about anything. I don't even know yeah. what to joke about at this point. So that's very sad. Well, that's changing and Hollywood is changing. I mean, no, you can't go to see films anymore. Everybody's watching Netflix. What do you think? being so connected to pop culture, what do you think the future holds? Well, I think um, uh, for a long time, the film industry has been really wanting to actually make it so that when movies are released, you can have the option to pay a little bit more money and see it in your living room instead of going to the theaters. But the theater industry is fighting back and they're the ones who have stopped this from happening because obviously with COVID, people were doing that. They were releasing movies that were supposed to be in theaters to our televisions in our living room. You just had to pay like a lot more money and it's the theater owners and the theater companies that are saying, no, 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 because they're going to go out of business because everybody wants to be able to watch stuff from home, right? We would much rather do that than go to the theater. Maybe for a, a couple movies, we would want to actually go to the theater to see, but I would love to be able to just watch movies in my living room like that. When they I, first come out. 
you know, the, the quarantine wasn't so bad for us because we live on a big ranch and we stay, we spend a lot of time at home. We, we live off the land. And so a good night for me has always been, you know, watching my favorite Netflix show or something with my dogs right there and having a glass of wine and it's great, but this is changing everything. Do you watch Netflix or do you, do you do, do you sit down and get comfy and watch Hulu or Netflix? What's your favorite show? Oh my gosh. Well, I'm watching Netflix, Hulu all the time, Amazon Prime all the time. The la I did watch the, we talked about Epstein earlier. I just watched that Epstein um, docuseries on Netflix, which was very, very good. I thought uh, I learned a lot that I didn't know. It's mm -hmm. just even, he's even worse than yeah. you could even imagine. Um, the Netflix is my, alt uh, or the Netflix, The Office is my all time favorite show, Ooh. which is on Netflix for a little bit longer. And I rewatch The Office. I'll start at season one, go all the way to season nine. And when I finish, I'll just restart it. It's on constant repeat in my house. I love it. I love it. I watch Ozark, d done all that, um, Outlander. <laughs> I could see you being an Ozark fan. I yeah. don't love it. You don't. No, but I love Dexter. I love Breaking Bad. And I feel mm. like those are have similarities, but I never could get into Ozark, but my parents love Ozark. Handmaid's Tale? Yes. Love Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale. Um, and a else? lot of a lot of conservatives say, like, well, I don't like that show because they're trying to say, like, that's what Trump's America is going to be like. And I'm no. like, no, no, I, I'm no. no, not at all. It is weird, though, that in um, Handmaid's Tale, they talk about this section, wherever it is in the United States that they sectioned off and they became super religious, is called Gilead. And Gilead is one of the pharmaceutical companies making the, the virus uh, vaccine. Yes, I've heard about that. That is super freaky. Yeah, Art I've imitates life or vice versa. <laughs> well, Alex, it's always been so much fun getting together with you. I hope you can come back again soon. I would love to, anytime. You awesome. just let me know, text me, girl. I will. All right, have a great day, Alex. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. No matter how difficult our day is, or what we look like, or how we feel, our faithful fur babies love us unconditionally. You know, spending time with your pet can help lower your blood pressure and cholesterol and prevent heart attacks. Just being around my dogs calms me and boosts my spirits. Check out my Shopify account and pick up a dog-loving t-shirt or mug today. Well, this is my favorite part of the whole show. We get to talk about viewers, what you guys are liking, and if you have any questions for me. And joining me is Diana. Diana, how are you? Hello. So we've been hearing a lot of questions about, you You know, things about people want to know about you lately. And one of the questions I have here, so Jill, which is actually from Michigan, oh. Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo, not too far. Right? I like she Kalamazoo. said. We would love to know a little more of those little unknown facts about you. So what is something that people don't know about you that they might find interesting? Well, some people know, but not everybody knows that I used to race motorcycles. Did you know that? I did not. Yeah. I I knew, you were a swimmer also, I right? I was a swimmer, yeah. I, knew I, used that. To race, I did not know about the motorcycles. I used to race motocross. Wow. Um, I have my older brother raced and I wanted to do everything he did. So I raced motocross when I was, I started, I think when I was around 10 or 12. And then I, when That's I was in early. my 20, yeah, I was like a tomboy. Yeah. And then I raced quads. Those are four wheelers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew them as four wheelers, but you're, quad. quads. If you're an expert, yeah, you might they call say them quad. quad racer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a little known fact. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So you were you were a tomboy. I was kind of a bad. I was a tomboy too. Yeah. I have three brothers, so Ooh. I had to be. Yeah. Mm. That makes us tough. Yes. That means it we does. don't put up with much. That's right. That's right. It's a good thing. Well, Diana, will you sit with me while we watch a funny pet video? Yes, my okay. favorite part. All right, roll them, Derek. Who did that? Don't look up there. I'm talking to y'all. Who did this mess? Who did this? <laughs> Who took the cookie off the counter? Who stole the cookie off the counter? So I'm going to ask you one last time. Who stole the cookie off the counter?
Did you? Well, thanks so much for joining me on another episode of Simply Shemaine. I hope you had as much fun as we did, and I hope you learned something. We'll see you here Tuesday, 5 p.m. every week.